So glad you could join us today. I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 17. Uh, It's a very familiar but challenging passage of Scripture. If you have a red letter edition New Testament, meaning that the words of Jesus himself are, are printed in the red color, you'll notice that most of the entire chapter, in fact, but for a few introductory words in chapter one, uh, it's an entirely red chapter of scripture, which uh, means that Jesus was himself speaking these words. And please remember that as we go along and read our text passage. We're going to read down through verse number 13 today and then jump into the message. Again, John chapter 17, I'll begin in verse number one. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. O now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which, are, which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, a reference to Judas Iscariot, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then verse 13 concludes with our text passage, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. The title of my message today is really more of a thought-provoking question. Are you living or merely existing? I'll describe the difference in a moment, but are you living, truly living, or merely existing? A few chapters back, Jesus gave the purpose in his coming, and he made this incredible statement, which is familiar to many of you, from John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you enjoy an abundant life? Why is it today that so many people, including many who claim to be Christians, are willing to settle for a, you know, kind of a blasé existence with no sense of purpose, no, no drive, no eternal view uh, about their life and the decisions they make on a regular basis? Why do so many people Uh, are they willing to live that way, going through the motions without any lasting fulfillment? I believe the vast majority of people today, certainly the lost, and even many who are claiming to be Christians, are merely existing. They have not discovered, or nor are they living in that abundant life description given to us by Jesus in John chapter 10. They really don't know what that means, or certainly on an experiential level, they don't live an abundant life on a daily basis. You know, they get up in the morning, and they do what they have to do. They go to work or they go to school or fulfill their responsibilities. Uh, Sometimes they plan out their meals. Um, They usually uh, clean something in the course of the day or should clean something. Certainly housewives do a lot of cleaning and they get down at the end of the day, they look back at what they've done and they, they may not verbalize this, but they question themselves. What was that about? What was today about? Did I really accomplish something meaningful today. They know that life is supposed to be far more than this repetition and obligation and empty responsibility, but they haven't quite discovered the secret of living life with that sense of lasting joy and happiness and peace. Some people try to find their fulfillment in their circumstances because those things change from day to day. You know, something good may happen to you today. 
course, then again, something bad may happen to you today. But they'll look back at the end of their day and they'll look back at circumstances that came into play and they'll determine whether that day was a good day or not based upon those circumstances. Maybe something good will happen to them. Uh, some people uh, will look back on their day and they'll, they'll, they'll focus the success of the day on something as simple and menial as, as uh, what they ate. Or they'll plan their day and look forward to uh, a meal or a fellowship setting where they can get together with other people they care about and love. Some people will watch a movie and they live their day in anticipation of the time when they can go home, kick off uh, their shoes, relax, and watch a good movie. Or uh, perhaps in our younger generation, they'll uh, engage in video gaming and they'll think the day has been good if they've, if they've matched or, or exceeded a high score on a video game that they have. And literally, their happiness is, revolves around these uh, circumstances that really in the big scale of life and eternity don't mean very much. Some people are wrapped up into sports teams, and I like sports as much as anybody, but their day was a good day or bad day based upon how things went uh, in the sports arena. <laughs> I don't know when you'll be viewing this or listening to this, but I'm preaching this message on a Tuesday. And last night, you know, I watched the NCAA basketball championship game. And uh, there, was, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of fans, sports fans, watching that game around the country and perhaps in other parts of the world, some of whom left the game with a sense of elation and joy that will soon fade, and others who were just desperately disappointed in the outcome of the game. And, and really, for many people, the, uh, their present circumstances or temporary happiness revolves around what happens to a sports team that they happen to follow or watch. Maybe in the course of your day, somebody will say something nice to you and you'll pillow your head that night and say, it's been a good day. Somebody recognized me or acknowledged me or I met somebody and they said something nice to me. And, and something as simple as that could determine their happiness. If it is not their circumstances that will make them happy or produce some meaning for and purpose in life, some people rely upon their achievements. You often find people that are uh, working in the job uh, market or they have a job that they like or perhaps even a job that they're good at and they'll find their sense of purpose in life and happiness and fulfillment in their job or perhaps for students they'll find it in their academic achievements. Uh, some of us uh, find a great deal of purpose in life through our family relationships. And I admire people who are dedicated and devoted to their family members. And, uh, but you know that Jesus said we should not solely find our happiness and joy and purpose even in something as important as our family or our marriage or with our children or our parents. Because those things, you have good days and you have bad days. And if you hang your hat on your family relationships alone, you will not have the kind of joy promised to us in John chapter 10, verse number 10. We have people in this church, in our church, that fit into every one of those categories. We have good, we have good uh, parents. We have good children. Uh, we have good people that are good at their jobs and that invest time and energy in their jobs. And they would be the first to stand forward and tell you that although they are uh, fulfilling their purpose and doing what they ought to be doing in those arenas, those things in and of themselves do not bring the joy and peace and happiness promised to us in God's word. It's not enough. It will never be enough. God did not create us to find our sense of being and our purpose and our joy in just our jobs or our families or um, our, 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 our homes or possessions. God had something far deeper in mind. Some people appear to be very successful on the outside, but inwardly they are empty. And they're unfulfilled and they're putting on a good face but they know something's missing in their lives and they can't quite put their finger on it. The life that Jesus promised us in John chapter 10, verse 10 is quite different from, from what I've been describing to you. It's, it goes beyond these circumstances or life's achievements. You know, it's more, far more than our accomplishments in life. It is something that will not fade away. It's something that the Lord wanted us to enjoy on a daily ongoing basis. 
Notice again the wording that Jesus used in the last verse of our text. He says, And now come I to thee, speaking to his Father, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus said, I want, I want them to experience the joy that I am presently experiencing now. I want my, my children to have that joy as well. You need to understand that Jesus didn't speak these words, um, uh, you know, in the context of a great meal or a time with good friends and fellowship or watching a sporting event, which they had, by the way, during those days. Jesus uttered these words about our experiencing true, lasting, meaningful joy while he was facing the cross. Many Bible scholars believe that these words in John chapter 17, we call it the, the Lord's high priestly prayer, that these words were uttered initially to his disciples at the Last Supper, hours away before he would be making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, hours away before the agony uh, when he prayed in it, he sweat as it were drops of blood as he realized what he would be facing in the very near future. Just hours before his arrest and his trial, and of course the agony of the cross and his crucifixion. He spoke these words near the end of his life. In this setting, Jesus prays that we might have his joy fulfilled in ourselves. Wow, that's pretty striking because we, didn't, we don't associate the events that Jesus was facing at that particular time with a time of joy. Now, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends upon our happenings, our circumstances. Joy is something that is given by God that is deep-seated and it doesn't go away because of our circumstances. Jesus was speaking about something supernatural. Jesus was speaking about something that God gives to us. So I ask you today, do you truly have the joy of the Lord in your heart? Are you, if I can post the question again, are you truly living? Have you found the life, the abundant life that Jesus has promised us? Or are you merely going through the motions and just existing? You know, I want you as your friend to have all that God has for each one of us. And I want us to examine particularly this first verse here in our text and touch on some things that Jesus shared with us regarding finding true purpose, meaning and joy in life. Something that would involve truly living and not just existing and going through the, the daily motions of our lives. Some things he touches on here that can help us. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down, first of all, a dependence on the Father. If we want true meaning in life, we have to live our lives in daily dependence upon the Father. Let me again quote the first part of verse number one of our text. These things spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father. You have to understand that that designation was foreign to the people of his day, to look at the God creator of the universe and refer to him as Father. But you know, the Lord not only allows us to enter into that relationship with him, he commands it. He wants us to understand that we who are saved are truly, in every sense, God's children. What a tremendous privilege. Jesus was not looking at his, at his outward circumstances. Of course, they were not too good about that time as he was about to approach the cross. He was not thinking about his past achievements. Although he was the son of God, he wasn't looking inwardly for his own strength and direction and meaning in life. Instead, he looked to heaven and gained strength from his father. There are many things that Jesus did and particularly things that he said which uh, have caused confusion, even among people today who study the Word of God and the Scriptures, because we recognize that Jesus is God. We refer to him, of course, as the Son of God, and he is that. He calls himself the Son of Man, but he was God come in the flesh. And some of the things that Jesus said in the Gospels have caused some people to question the validity of the deity of Christ, meaning, was he truly God or not, or was he just merely a man? Of course, he said those things for a purpose, and in this context, Jesus made some reference to things to show that he was living his life in submission to God. It was not that he was not God come in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. In fact, you could, and I would encourage you to read 
uh, the entire chapter. There are many allusions here in John chapter 17 alone that speak about the, the role of the Lord's deity, that he was indeed God come in the flesh. But I just want to refer you to verse 5 as an example. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, O now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. If you just had that verse alone, you'd have to come to the conclusion that Jesus existed with the Father, which he did, in creation, in creating the whole world and everything in it. Or you'd have to say that he was a terrible liar and a fake. <laughs> Jesus was God and is God. But he came to earth and he took upon a submissive role as he went about doing his father's will in providing himself as a sacrifice for mankind's sins. And therefore he makes references here in John chapter 17 to the fact that he was living in daily dependence upon the father. Certainly his comments in the Garden of Gethsemane reinforce that, that he was asking that that cup might pass from him. He knew about the tremendous not just the physical agony and the terrible circumstances revolving uh, around his crucifixion on a cross, but it was that spiritual battle and sacrifice that he made that was like something that we will never experience, perhaps nor fully understand when he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. Jesus was living in dependence upon the Father. He spoke these words in John chapter 5, verse 30, I can of mine own self do nothing. But you have to listen to the context of that verse. Let me read you the rest of John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. What Jesus was saying here is he refused to live his life independent of the Father. He would follow the Father's will in all ways and decisions he made in his earthly ministry, which is pretty amazing to us as we consider the fact that here's Jesus, the heaven sent son of God, God come in the flesh, the one who would be our ultimate sacrifice on the cross, who said, I want to live my life in daily, and I'm living my life in daily dependence upon the father. And we who are mere mortals, sinners saved by the grace of God, we go through our lives with an assumption that we can live our lives any way that we want to and not live them in dependence upon God. And I guarantee you when we do that, we will never find the lasting joy and peace that God promised to us. Do you realize that every person who was ever healed by Jesus, every sermon that was ever preached, every temptation that Jesus overcame and every miracle that he performed ever all of these were made possible because he trusted in and depended upon the direction and guidance of his heavenly father. And then we, <laughs> who are frail sinners, we go through our lives and we come to the conclusion that we can live our lives any way that we want. We don't pause to ask God for his direction and guidance in our lives when we're making important life-changing decisions. We just sort of go, go with it, you know, or do what we think is best. You know, if God says no about something, we still say, yes, we're going to do it and proceed right through. We do that many times. In the area of evangelism, an area that we should completely depend upon the leading and guidance and the power and conviction of God to convict the lost sinner and give us the words to say and use his word to bring the power of the gospel to the ears and the hearts of lost sinners. We go about our evangelism without any dependence upon the Father. We think the better we know the verses and the more, uh, you know, eloquent we are in presenting the gospel, the better chances a people have of being saved. It couldn't be further from the truth. God alone saves. We are simply his instruments. We should depend upon God in our evangelism. We live our lives sometimes with little regard to God's protection and safety. <laughs> you know, when is the last time you stopped and said, Lord, I need you to watch over me today? I don't know what may come today, but I, I depend upon you for my well-being and my safety. Lord, please put a hedge of protection about my life and the lives of my family members. Even church ministry, by and large, is conducted on a weekly basis without a, a firm, deep-seated dependence upon God and direction from Him. How presumptuous of us. <laughs> 
to live our lives that way, independent of God, without daily depending upon Him and looking to Him for direction. The Bible says here that Jesus lifted up His eyes to heaven. He did that on earlier occasions as well. One day Jesus, the Bible says, lifted His eyes up toward heaven, and doing so, He fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fishes. Another day, he lifted his eyes to the Father, and a deaf man received his hearing. He also looked to heaven in dependence upon the Father, and he cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And we all know how that story ended. We're not really living until we learn how to live day by day in dependence upon the Father. That's, just a, that's more than just an, act, an acknowledgement verbally, God, I need your help today. It's living with a mindset and a, and a reality that we can do nothing without our Father's help in our lives and depending upon Him for every circumstance of life. We're good at depending upon others. Perhaps sometimes we do that more than we should. We're, we're good at trying to evaluate and, and pull from our resources what we can use to help us to get through. We're also good at looking at ourselves to try to get us through some difficult situations or get us through the day, so to speak. But how are we really at depending upon the Father. Well, that's a key to finding true meaning in life, not just existing, but a, a person, a Christian who can live his or her life on daily dependence upon God will find that joy and fulfillment and purpose that they are desperately seeking for. Not only is there a dependence on the Father, but secondly, I want you to notice a divine sense of destiny. Notice again in that first verse how Jesus said, the hour is come. The hour is come. There's, God had a plan, and there was a destiny laid out for Jesus Christ, and for each one of us as well, by the way. And he knew that that hour was there. On previous occasions, multiple occasions, he said quite the opposite. There were other settings where he said, this is not the time. This is not, this is not my destiny. Once Jesus was at a marriage feast in Cana of Galilee, and his mother Mary came to him, and was saying to him, we're out of, we're out of wine. We can't, we can't uh, give drink to our guests, to the guests here at this wedding reception. And Jesus said in John chapter 2, verse, verse 4, Mine hour is not yet come. That wasn't the time for him to be revealed to those around him. Then there was a time that his brothers urged him to attend the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and they said, when you get in that setting, they, they knew now how he was accomplishing his role. And they knew who he was. And they said, when you're there at that feast, it's time for you to reveal yourself as the Messiah, as the one sent from God. And again, he said in John chapter 7, verse 6, my time is not yet come. On yet another occasion, Jesus was speaking in the temple. And there were those who disagreed with his message because he was equating himself with God. He was fulfilling his role as the Messiah, and they disagreed with that. And they sought, the religious leaders sought to arrest him there on the spot, but they were not able to because the Bible says in John chapter 7, verse number 30, his hour was not yet come. Same thing happened a chapter later when he was in the treasury. Again, they were supernaturally prevented from arresting him. They had determined to do so, Jesus didn't resist them. He didn't have an army behind him. But God was intervening because God had a, a plan of destiny mapped out for his life. And again, in John chapter 8, verse 20, it says his hour was not yet come. In all those settings, he kept saying, this is not the hour. This is not the time. But in our text setting, he says, my hour is here. The hour is come. You say, Pastor, what hour? The hour he would be delivered up, tried, falsely accused, crucified on that cross, and he gave his life for mankind's sins. The time was now ready for that. His hour and his destiny would be fulfilled. From the moment that Jesus invaded planet Earth in the form of a baby in Bethlehem, everything was leading to the cross. One of the most frustrating ways to live your life is to live your life without purpose. And so if I said to you today, why are you here? Or what is your life about? What plan does God have for you? If you don't have answers to those kinds of questions, you are living your life without purpose. And therefore, you will never find the abundant life, the joyful life full of purpose and meaning until you know that God has a destiny laid out for you. He has a plan laid out for your life. 
Years ago, I was just cr- kind of cruising through life and, and through circumstances that I'll forever be grateful for. God brought people into my life to point me to Jesus Christ. I was just kind of, like many of us, just going through and accepting life day by day, looking for the greatest amount of happiness I could find and doing whatever I thought would make me happy. I was very selfish, very self-centered. And the Lord sent somebody to point me to the Savior. I was gloriously saved by the grace of God. And even then, in the early years of my Christian life, uh, I was rather living a rather self-centered life. I just did what I wanted to do. Uh, Of course, I had a different purpose and I was forgiven and I understood the debt that I owed to Jesus Christ. But I was just, I was dependent upon other people. I had people that were instrumental in leading me to Christ in the first place. Others were mentoring me or discipling me. And I thank God for those people. I had a faithful pastor who preached the word of God to me and Christians friends who would encourage me. And I was just pretty much enjoying the benefits of all these people sent by God into my life to help me to grow and appreciate this newfound relationship that I had as God's child. But it didn't dawn on me initially, at least, that there was more to life than just going through and appreciating what other people were doing to invest their lives in me. All of these things, of course, are gifts from God, and we should not take them for granted. But at some point, it was really the preaching of God's word. I came to understand that there's a greater purpose for my life than to just depend upon others and to live off the encouragement and the nurturing of other Christians. At some point, God, the Holy Spirit, spoke to me and said, you know, there's going to be a time where you need to recognize that you should invest your life in other people as so many have invested their lives in you as a young man. Not yet out of my teens, I walked forward in a church service and I knelt at an altar and I said, Lord, I don't know what it is you want me to do, but I've come to realize that true living, not just existing, but true living involves me serving you and that involves serving other people. And I said, Lord, if there's something that you want me to do, I, I want to I wanna get the best of life. I want to get everything that you have planned out for me. Now, at that point, I had no idea whatsoever the Lord would ever call me into ministry. Probably a good thing. I might have turned tail and run the other direction. But, you know, at that moment, I said, God, there's surely something that I can do to serve you. And I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not telling you something you don't know about. There are many of you that are listening to this message and understand this from the depths of your heart. You really started to live your life when you learned the secret of serving God, of serving the Lord Jesus Christ in some capacity. You know, he's given us all gifts and abilities. We're not all going to do the same thing, but God's got something for all of us to do. And our purpose and meaning in life, it will be centered upon our ability to find what God has for us and to pursue that divine destiny. A map has been laid out for our lives by God himself, and he gives us the choice whether to pursue that and find the abundant life that he's promised us or go on our selfish ways. And I'm ashamed to say, at least initially, for the first year or two that I became a Christian, I pretty much lived for myself. And I'm so thankful all these many years later that God broke my heart about my need to serve my Savior, Jesus Christ, by serving other people. Then we'll really be living. Which leads us to the last point. If you notice again from verse 1, a desire to glorify God. That will give us purpose in life. That will help us to truly live rather than just exist. Let me read the entire verse 1 again from John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. It was a desire of Jesus Christ to use the glory bestowed upon himself to bring glory to this Father in heaven. And that's our purpose for living as well. Our purpose can be summarized in the phrase that we are to bring glory to God. Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, every decision that we make ought to be determined on the basis of how we can bring glory to God and to his son, Jesus Christ. Let me reread verses 2 through 5 to you today. Jesus says that thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is the life eternal, 
that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee, he says in verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus even bring glory, brought, glory, brought glory to the Father through his death. Imagine that. God may or may not call us to make such an ultimate sacrifice, but I promise you this much, when we determine to live our lives for the glory of God, it will involve some sacrifice, many sacrifices actually. It may involve experiencing things or enduring things that we'd rather not go through, but that's all part of following the map that God has placed in our lives and pursuing his purpose. If we are truly determined to bring glory to God, it may involve some difficulties and hardships, but I'll tell you what, it will also bring lasting and meaningful fulfillment. Not just at a future time when we stand before the Lord and are rewarded for our labors, but in this life also. We get to wake up in the morning and recognize, I have a reason for being here. God has a destiny for me, a path for my life. I'm to serve Jesus Christ and bring glory to the Father, and I am looking forward to what He has for me in the near future. That's what it's all about. That's what bringing glory to God is all about. Many Christians today are living a selfish life. And I'll tell you this, a selfish life is always a miserable life. When things don't go our way, when circumstances are not favorable that particular day, when we can no longer rest upon our achievements or our past laurels, we need something we can sink our teeth into that will give us purpose and meaning in life. And if you're living a selfish life, I want to encourage you to ask God to break your heart and to show him how you might, in some tangible way, serve him and bring glory to him. When we can honestly say, Lord, whether I live or die, whether things go well for me today or they're difficult, whether people treat me with respect or disdain the message that I bring to them, I am going to live for you and bring glory to you. You will find true living and not merely existing. Jesus put it this way. In his own words, he said this, For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? You see, Jesus is touching on something here. That's the difference between truly living the abundant life that God has promised and merely existing merely going through the motions. You know, we need to lose our life in Jesus Christ. We need to let God lay out a path and a destiny for our lives to find some tangible way to serve him and bring glory to him. And when we've discovered those secrets that Jesus addressed here in this chapter, we'll truly be living. We'll be on our way to an abundant, fulfilling life. And that's what it's all about. That, that is my wish for you, but more than that, that is the plan of Jesus for your life. He came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. So please don't settle for second best. Get all that God has for you. Shall we pray to that end? Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege to be called your child. But we also are uh, in many places in scripture referred to as your servant. There's a plan you have for our lives. There's something for us to do. You've got something for all of us to do to serve you. We want to live our lives in such a way that we are bringing glory to you and to your Father in heaven. That's what you did. You, the heaven-sent Son of God, invested uh, your entire earthly life in bringing glory to your heavenly Father. And we ought to do the same as well. And the byproduct of all of this is that we'll find a sense of purpose and meaning that will not just go through the motions of life and, and fulfill our earthly responsibilities, but we'll be drawing close to you as we depend upon you, as we see you work in our lives, as we witness you blessing others and bringing others to Jesus Christ through our witness and our testimony. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're asking for, Lord, that you give each one of us that abundant life. Help us not to settle for second best because we serve the very Lord of the universe. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. 
We're quickly approaching the time of the year where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it often affords me, I hope you as well, a time for reflection. And maybe as we're thinking about the events of the cross, the days preceding it and what happened afterward, and you reflect and pray and read the scripture passages relating to the Easter story, I hope and pray that you'll be strangely drawn into a desire to have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants that for our lives. And I hope you pursue that and you find that. The week following, we'll be doing some things at our church ministry to reach out to our community. We have a friend day plan. And I would appreciate as we lead up to those couple weeks ahead, as we prepare for that friend day, that you would pray, because prayer is one of the greatest works that the believer can engage in. You would pray that God would use that day to encourage believers and draw the lost to himself. And in that way, you can find purpose and meaning to life as well. Appreciate you partnering with us. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful week.